auction yesterday? No, I didn't get a chance to. Oh, well, it was a terrible experience. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, interesting. 68 horses brought $1,800,000. The average somewhere on the geldings is awful close to $30,000 a horse. Uh, the interesting, really interesting thing is that it was a political statement. The government intends to take all of my money. I am going to have some fun with what I've got. That was exactly the spirit that was there. Uh, if you voted for Biden, you certainly took your pin off and put it inside your shirt. Uh, uh, because it became very, very, it, it became a political event, completely without Kurt's help uh, uh, or Ken's help or the auctioneer's help. I mean, it was amazing. It really was. There was about 400 people there. Uh, I mean, nearly, I have no idea how many states, but they went to Alabama and Mississippi and Delaware and, and uh, Florida. They went everywhere, Pennsylvania. They went everywhere. Uh, so it was, it was unbelievable. Uh, a really neat thing, we had a guy there that uh, they had me introducing. Uh, he bought a horse there four years ago. And, uh, and, uh, he wrote it again the day before the sale. Well, you say, big deal. What's so big about that? Well, the fact that he's 96. Uh, <laughs> the fact that he's 96. Uh, uh, and making it even more special was the fact that, you know, most 96-year-old people don't remember where they were on February 19, 1945. But he does. He was a Marine in the first fleet of men landing on Iwo Jima. <laughs> what a joy to be able to introduce that man. You know, uh, Colonel Tom, uh, Corporal Tom Guthrie. Uh, and healthy and vibrant, <coughs> and I'll tell you what, uh, 10 minutes standing ovation uh, for that man. That was really, really cool. And uh, he promised to be back next year. <laughs> so uh, I added to that good Lord willing, and the, the guy with him and the Greek don't rise. So, uh, but uh, uh, that was really, really neat. You know, there aren't many of those World War II veterans left, and, 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 and one that uh, was in the first, uh, he was a Marine in the first flight of invaders uh, uh, in the Iwo Jima. So uh, what, a, what a joy that was to uh, have him and to be able to do that. We've got a couple of new people with us. We've got a Joyce back here next to Dr. Story. Uh, right behind Joyce. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then right behind Mrs. Story. And watch me drop the ball here. I, I think it's Abby. It's Abby. It's Abby. And a minute ago, I had her husband's name. Well, uh, it's with a C. It's with a C. Cameron. Cameron. OK, Abby and Cameron. Uh, and they are just new here, just moved here. So let's stand together and go to, uh, uh, where are we going? 660. Uh, and then you can go meet them. Abby and Cameron and Joyce. Let's stand together. I will serve.
We're friends. This is Mark and I'm Heather. Mark and Heather. Mark and Rob going to church with you. All right. All right. We're <laughs> blessed to have you. All right, go attack. <laughs> so uh, uh, the trip to Alaska is currently off. Um, uh, hey, we, uh, Levon had to, had to stop for a checkup at the doctor's office in Powell before we went down Thursday. Uh, uh, they took her from that checkup straight to a CAT scan and we were going, we were entering the canyon when they called and said, if you're driving, pull over the car. Uh, and you'll be in surgery Friday. Uh, for a growth in the bladder. Uh, so they don't have any more idea than that, what it is, but uh, uh, they said, you know, cancel all plans uh, because that's, the, that's what you are doing in spite of what you might have thought you were doing. So uh, uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you have to know my wife. Uh, she says, Kurt, you're going to Alaska anyway. I said, honey, it's not going to happen. Yes, it is going to happen. She said, I would rather die alone than have my sister-in-law and I get in that house. So she said, you promised me right now you are going. Well, you have any idea what my kids think of me? <laughs> you think they didn't tell me? Dad, you are worse than a barbarian. <laughs> she finally said, the only way you will stay home is if Jeff and Carol call and say, don't come. So as soon as we got back last night into cell phone range, their call came through. Don't you dare think of coming. And so she was willing to accept that. And uh, so that's where we are. Uh, we'll keep you appraised as we go. We'll let you know where it's at, and what's happening. Um, but for now, her mother had one in the bladder also that was fine. So that's back there. Uh, I, I get the idea. I mean, she's been asking them to check this out for a year, and it's been, oh, don't worry, this is nothing, this is nothing. Uh, now suddenly it's full of car over. Uh, uh, I don't want you driving when I tell you this. Uh, so something's changed rapidly, apparently. Uh, so anyway, that's where we are. Uh, systemic racism. <laughs> I make a statement from time to time here that some people may think is a, an off-the-cuff, trite statement that doesn't mean anything. Uh, if I notice new people here, I'm inclined to say we want to welcome you here. I want you to know that for the most part, you're among a group of people are, that are nothing but mostly converted white trash. <laughs> I've made that statement several times, and some people might think that's just supposed to be some kind of a funny statement. But it's not. I don't mean that as a funny statement. I mean that it doesn't matter who walks through that door. They are every bit the equal of every human being that's ever walked through that door. And this congregation will love them if they've got an eye in the middle of their forehead. This congregation will love them anyway. And so when I say that, that's what I mean. We are, there is nobody in this building that's one bit better than the other. Uh, so. Uh, last summer, uh, in Bridger, Montana, stood this poor 20-year-old girl, white girl, tears streaming down her face. Standing there, tears in Bridger, Montana, tears streaming down her face with a placard in the air, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> that was the Bridger demonstration. She was the entire demonstration. That's all there was. Uh, well, obviously, she felt it with all of her heart. Uh, in July and August, uh, 
uh, we were told, uh, even I heard it on Fox News, that uh, Black Lives Matter was the most powerful political force at that moment in the world. Ah! In the world. Not just here, but the most powerful political force in the world in July and August of last year was Black Lives Matter. <laughs> now my original intent was to not waste sermon time on that topic. That was my, I'm just not going to waste the sermon on this topic. I'm not going there. It's not worth my time or your time to go there. Now, however, we are learning that this, this issue is infiltrating evangelical churches at a high rate of speed. Evangelical churches are buying into this rapidly, and that does change where we're at, and therefore uh, I decided I, I was in fact going to uh, look at it because it's become a windstorm in our culture that we're not going to be able to avoid. The problem really became public with Barack Obama in 2008. Now, it's been bubbling, apparently, since the early 90s. But most of us had no idea it was out there. You know, critical race theory. Uh, uh, who would, you know, what is it? And who would care? And where has it been? And all of that. Uh, we didn't know, and nobody cared. It's been there in the colleges since the 90s, but he brought it front and center in 2008. So, uh, it has uh, now got to the point where it has Im impacted virtually everybody. So even though I didn't intend to discuss this topic, uh, I, I've been reading books on it uh, right along. Uh, Jason Riley, I have three books by Jason Riley, black man, uh, journalist, uh, uh, big author in the Wall Street Journal, part of a think tank on cultural change in America. Uh, he's got three books, this one, False Black Power, uh, good book. I couldn't find the third one this morning, and I don't remember the title. Uh, but I love this book of his, Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed. Huh. Uh, this, this is like just reading one uh, study after another. He probably cites 150 or 200 studies in here, and you just go from one to the next, that indicate that since 1960, the Democratic Party has done nothing but use and abuse racial issues as a way to further their own cause at the cost of black people. That in the end, they push them backwards, and that everything in their world is more difficult today because they've been helped so much by the liberal cause. And uh, so he's got three books. Uh, they're not easy reading because you're just reading one report after another report after another report after another report that documents how the culture has gone backwards since 1960 as a result of the Democratic Party. If you haven't read Candace Owens, now there's a fun book. Uh, Candace Owens, one delightful black girl that I'll tell you what, she makes the reading fun. Uh, she really, really does. Uh, it's all fun with Candace. Uh, but she says the same thing. Uh, she, she, she comes to the same point. And her book is not written to you and me. It's written to her own people. Uh, her own people. She's saying, come on, take a look. They are drowning us one at a time. Uh, look around you. See what they've done for us. We're actually behind where we were. And she was a girl that came from, from rags. Um, you know, she was a, a poor kid in the ghetto uh, who brought herself up. Uh, Candace and her book, Blackout, is really fun to read. That's a fun read. Uh, Bill Willowby has called me. I love it when Bill calls me and says, I got a new book for you. Ah, that means you're in for it. That means you're in for it. I have peacefully decided these were fun books, but I wasn't going to worry about it 
uh, I wasn't going to bother going there until Bill calls me. Yeah, I got a book for you. This is not easy reading, he says. Uh, and I kind of had to read it a couple hours at a time. Uh, so I went over to pick it up. And instantly, instantly, uh, Jay, instantly, uh, I always look for the author first, Bodie Bachman. <laughs> Uh, how many of you remember us having Bodie Bachman here, huh? Uh, not a lot. 2010. 2010. Uh, this black man, six foot six tall, uh, nearly that wide. <laughs> Giant of a black man. Came with his son. We had him in Cody. We rented the cattle uh, company building in Cody. Uh, had a lot of people there. I invited anybody in Cody that wanted to come. Uh, he, he was not speaking on, on uh, race in 2010 to us. Uh, we had him there in, in relationship to all things spiritual. Uh, uh, tremendous man of God. And uh, uh, so the second he showed me that Bodhi Bachman wrote it up, I knew I would like it regardless of how hard it was because we had such enormous respect uh, for Bodhi Bachman. Uh, so he isn't worried at all about what's happening uh, in, in, in New York City. He's worried about what's happening in churches across America. And that's what this book is about. And therefore, uh, in reading that book this week, uh, I decided, well, we are going to go here. We are going to. Uh, uh, if, you, if you get this paper, raise your hand. Uh, yeah, the rest of you need to sign up. Uh, 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 I can't even say infamous, whatever, infamous, I don't know. Uh, uh, great, it's from Hillsdale College. Uh, this is an expert, this, this, is, this particular paper is by the, the guy who has dissected critical race theory more than anybody else. Uh, and so he really defines what it is, why it is, and I'll give you some of the highlights of that as, as we look at it, uh, but, but that's, that, that's who I looked at uh, for this particular situation. Vody uh, uh, tells us that uh, in reality, back in the first century, the Gnostics were bringing in Gnosticism into the church, false doctrine. And he said, the threat that critical race theory poses to evangelistic preaching is as great as the Gnostics were in the first century. He said, this really is major and we better be watching for it. Okay? Now I'm going to read to you a little and I know that reading is always difficult because people really don't like me to read too much. That's so sad, too bad. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to read a little to you. Uh, I'm going to, uh, from Bodhi because Bodhi's Bodhi's worth reading. Uh, I started writing and speaking on political issues in 2008 during Barack Obama's first run for the White House. At that time, I warned repeatedly of his culturally Marxist worldview. I also warned that an Obama presidency would not heal, but rather deepen ethnic tensions in America. Okay? Uh, then he says, in regards to today, the United States is on the verge of a literal race war, if not a complete cultural meltdown. And the rest of the Western world seems to be following suit. Tensions are rising every place the African slave trade has left its indelible mark. So that's why the movement is around the world, not just here, you know. It's a movement that's around the world. It's not just an us movement, okay? Now, you know, I, I trust you know, that this week there was an important presidential announcement. Our president announced to us that the most pressing problem America faces is systemic racism. And the second most threatening problem to the American way of life is COVID. Now, in order for you to get an appreciation for how serious this is, I want you to imagine that you are on the maintenance crew 
of a cruise ship. Okay? You're on the maintenance crew of a cruise ship, and the head of the maintenance department is none other than Joe Biden. You are in the bottom layer of the cruise ship when they scrape an iceberg and tear a hole in the side of the ship. You instantly call the head of maintenance, Mr. Biden, and report to him that the boat is taking on water rapidly, and his response will be, I'm sorry, but I'm working on the air conditioner right now. That puts this in perspective. This is nonsense, complete nonsense. This is stupidity magnified over. Okay? All right. Page two. We're done with that. Truth is, the left wants this to be a problem. They are fanning the fire, making this a problem. Every book, everybody, every author, black authors, I love it. Please leave us alone. Please quit helping us. All you do, all your help is doing is hurting us. But they are all calling for true equality. This is a good line. Anyone who believes true equality is attainable is a fool. Only fourth graders believe the world's going to be fair. Huh? Do you know that there are people of privilege? All right. You're driving in Bighorn County over the speed limit at the same time that I am driving in Bighorn County over the speed limit. We both get stopped by deputies. The deputy that stops you doesn't know you. The deputy that stops me instantly recognizes that I'm the chaplain for the department. Do you think I might have privilege? Yeah, you gotta be brain dead. <laughs> Scott, Scott was a cop. How come you always let me go? <laughs> he didn't, he didn't. I just pick on him. <laughs> it's inevitable. All right, the headlines in Monday's Billings newspaper. COVID relief given unevenly to native tribes. COVID relief given unevenly to native tribes. Who gave out the native, who gave out the COVID relief? A nice government agency specializing in fair treatment to all. Huh? We are brain dead if we think it's going to be fair. Ah, okay, bring it down a notch closer. The, the Cheyenne tribe, Jesse's tribe, received $8 million. They have a total of 2,500 members. That's a check for $3,200 a person. But none of them got it. The tribe is run by one family. And they are complaining that there's no justice even within 2,500 people. Now, if the world goes on 4,000 more years, there will be just as many stories to tell about unfair treatment as there are today because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. It has nothing to do with anything but the fact that this is a fallen world. Satan runs the systems of the world He's going to keep right on running them until the Lord returns, and we're going to have to deal with this same situation. So, two questions. Has the black race gone backward? And if so, is it my fault? Well, you probably saw it on the internet this week, too. Uh, you'll recognize this story. A nine-year-old black kid went into a library in Georgia to get a book. They wouldn't give him a book. This many years ago. 
many years ago. He went in to get a book. They wouldn't give him a book. He wouldn't leave. They finally called law enforcement, and they escorted the little black nine-year-old kid out of that library. Okay? He went on to become an astronaut, and today the library is named after him. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. There he was, not even allowed in the building when he was a kid, and today it's named after him. That's progress. That's forward progress. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. We can tell Ben Carson stories and all kinds of other stories of individual people who have gone forward because of the opportunity. Things have changed. Things have changed. So, but blacks as a culture have gone backward. I know you want me to read some more from Bodie. But this is cool. My dad was a handsome multi-sport athlete. He stood six foot six with broad shoulders, a booming voice, and a personality more imposing than was his stature. My mom stood five foot four. But more than held her own. She had a keen mind, a sharp wit, and an infectious smile. She was a stellar student designed for greatness. Their high school romance turned into a teenage pregnancy, a shotgun wedding, and a brief marriage that could not withstand their personal differences or my father's departure for the university and a career in professional football. Now eventually his father dies a drug addict, okay? But his mother believed she was in charge of her child. Her mother didn't always make the, uh, the, the teacher's uh, uh, student when, when a parent-teacher conference. She missed parent-teacher conference. My mother always had a couple of jobs, so instead of going to teacher conference, she would just drop into school whenever she could. So the day she dropped in during my reading time was not good. As she met with the teacher, she noticed that the books on my group's table were different than the books on other group's reading tables. She asked about it and was told that my group was at a lower reading level, at which point my mother called me to the teacher's desk, gave me a look that shook me to the core, <laughs> then turned to the teacher and said, give me a book. The teacher reached for one of the readers on her desk. No, my mother corrected her, give me your book. The teacher protested, assuring my mother that her book was far beyond my reading level, at which, at which point my mother simply pointed to the book and held out her hand. The teacher handed her the book. My mother opened it to a random page, handed it to me, then folded her arms and said, read this, son. I knew I was in trouble. There was no way out of this. If I fumbled through the book, my mother would know I was playing dumb at school. However, if I read it, my teacher would know I had been, well, playing dumb at school. <laughs> Either way, I knew I would be toast when this was over. So I did the only thing I could, I began to read the book. The teacher, a rather pale white woman, began to grow increasingly red. Her jaw dropped, her eyes doubled in circumference. She tried to speak, but the words wouldn't even come. I finished the passage, handed the book back to my mother, turned and walked back to my group, but it wasn't over. Before I could get back to my table, my mother said, oh no, that's not your group anymore. <laughs> then she told the teacher, I'll, I see that all his little buddies are at that table. Bodhi doesn't care about reading as much as he cares about being with his homeboys. And she was right. I was a little black kid that grew up in South Central Los Angeles when the Crips and the Bloods ran everything. It wasn't cool to hit the books, so I underperformed so as not to stand out. 
but not that day. That day, Frances Buckman had come to class. That day, she reminded me and my teacher that she, not the streets, would have the last word in my life. <laughs> yes. Uh, several years later, he was in high school uh, playing for a coach that apparently was famous in Texas. He was called uh, Diz Reeves, uh, and he was a famous football coach in Texas. And, uh, and Bodie brought home a C on a progress report. And mother told him that not only was he not going to play in the next game, but he couldn't even go to the practice. So he went to the coach and says, my mother won't let me come anymore. At which point, the coach called his mother and said, uh, said to her, Mrs. Buckman, you need to understand this is only a progress report. His mom says, I am aware of that coach. The coach goes on, I assure you, ma'am, voting will bring the grade up by the end of the semester. Mom, oh, trust me, I know he will. At least he better. <laughs> Coach Reeves, ma'am, your son is one of the smartest players I've ever had. Mom, this is not about how dumb your other players are. <laughs> <laughs> this is about how dumb, this is not, this is not about how dumb your other players are about, this is about what I expect of my son. I can't recall exactly what my mother said after that. What I can tell you is that Coach Reeves' side of the conversation suddenly turned into a series of yes ma'ams, no ma'ams, and, and then finally, I understand ma'am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, now that's what's wrong with the black culture. That's what's happened, is that there aren't enough moms, there aren't enough dads. If you uh, if you go to if you go to this one, you discover seventy percent of the black kids are without a dad, and that that happened when the Great Society under Lyndon Johnson was initiated, made it easier to be a black woman without a husband than it did to have a husband, and they paid you to get rid of your husband, and thus destroyed the family thus destroyed the family. That was the game they played, and uh, uh, a, a line I wasn't going to quote, you know I do that all the time. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say this. Oh, I can't help but say this. When Lyndon Johnson got through, when he, when he got the, his, his great poverty bill passed, talking to two state governors, he said, this will keep those N-word voting Democrat for the next 200 years. And that's the slavery that it has created. That is the slavery that it has created. Um, so, Vody goes on to discuss how in fact uh, the BLM thing is completely fraudulent and phony. And this week you probably did notice that the BLM director quit because after a year of working there, he agrees with all of the charges against it. It is phony, it is fraudulent, and it's anti-American. So critical race theory really comes out of the 1990s. It is Marxist completely, and it began because Marxism and takeovers of countries require a victim. They've got to have a victim. In Russia, it worked to put the rich against the poor. That worked. But in America, it just has not worked. It hasn't worked. So they had to come up with something they thought would work, and they determined in the early 1990s that race would be a way to divide our nation. And so that has been the effort ever since they have gone on that way. By 2010, it became a college course, critical race theory. And today, in schools across the nation, uh, kids are, are, white kids are forced to apologize to all their little black friends because 
they are victimizing their black friends. There was a great, great post on Facebook this week by a black father with a three-year-old child, and, and he was saying, you know, kids just love everybody. Kids aren't smart enough to not love people. And, and, and it was a very wonderful, wonderful post that he made, and uh, it, it, it was very, very positive. Uh, now, I have no knowledge at all of what the Southern Baptist Church, why do I care about the Southern Baptist Church? Because they are the largest denomination of Protestants in the world, okay? So they're important to us even if you're not one of them, okay? The church in Clark is one of them, uh, but they're not a Southern Baptist church. They may think they are. I really think there's only one person who thinks they are, maybe, but... <laughs> But that, if we were to put it on the door, that would be the sign we put on the door, but we very carefully don't put it on the door. Okay, all right. So, I have no idea what their, what their position was in the 1990s. I, I really don't know what that position was. Uh, but in 1995, they made a world apology Southern Baptist Convention in 1995 made a world apology for their former position on race, stating that they had misinterpreted scripture. Aha! Okay, now, me. I arrived in South Carolina in 1967, and I suddenly learned that all black people were the descendants of Ham, the son of Noah, who mocked his father's nakedness, and that the sons of Noah were cursed to be servants of others throughout the rest of time. Wow. That's what I began to learn from the people around me in South Carolina in 1967. Interesting, interesting, if you have the NIV Bible, study Bible, and you might have, somebody might have theirs right here, that doctrine was apparently widespread enough that if you have the NIV study Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 5, and it will, it will tell you that, uh, in fact, uh, Noah's prophecy cannot be used to justify enslavement of blacks since his descendants were Caucasians. That's the NIV study Bible. Well... It's possible, even likely, that that was the doctrine of the Southern Baptist Convention in the 1990s. Very possible that that's what it was. Uh, but today, the Southern Baptist Convention is now embracing critical race theory. They are embracing it. So the kicker is, why do we care? Because suddenly, Christian authors that we buy all the time from Christian book distributors are beginning to infiltrate their material with critical race theory. We need to apologize for all of our, okay? All right, all right. Now, Bodie says what's developed in the last few years is an 11th commandment. Be ethnically nice, and disregard the other Ten Commandments. That's the new commandment that is being preached in books that are coming out. It's all about, you need to be ethnically nice. Now he says, you can, I thought this was good, he said, you can do all the studies you want about how preachers are humble and all of this nonsense. But he said, if you get ten preachers together, it is inevitable that pretty soon they begin to look at each other. How many people you got coming to your church? And before long, we rank ourselves by who's got the most people. And he says, that's gone on forever. But he says, that's not what's going on today. Today it's, what's your ethnic mix? That's the biggest question at every church today. What's your ethnic mix? What's your ethnic mix? It's all about our ethnic mix, not the gospel. It's not about preaching the gospel. 
It's about the ethnic mix. You better have the right ethnic mix. Now I want to look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul speaking. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and to become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, a slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Now, since God chose you to be a holy people, he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderness, mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always to be thankful. Okay? Racism is not a godly attitude. <laughs> Racism is not a godly attitude. For you, me, or anybody else, it simply isn't. But critical race theory is not about loving other people. It's about dividing the country. Okay? So, the truth is, in 1950, only 5% of Americans we're open to the idea of interracial marriage, okay? This is, this is a real indicator of what's happened. 1950, only 5% wasn't even legal to marry interracially in many states until 1967, okay? But today, there is 83% approval of bringing somebody home to meet dad who's not of the same ethnic background. 83%, it's gone from 5% to 83%. We've gone from 300,000 interracial couples in 1970 to two and a half million today. So we've made enormous progress. Five states, five states, Texas, Oklahoma, Idaho, Tennessee, and Montana have outlawed critical race theory in their schools because it is so divisive. So, Coming to God. Maybe you met this kid. I don't know if you met this kid or not. Uh, he's about 30 years old, and he came to the Joshua house, and he, he was knocking on the door. But I was busy eating a taco or something, and I didn't want to go to the door, so I did the same to him that I do to you. Come in! <laughs> so he knocked a little louder. Did he miss it? You guys over there, you guys across the street from me? He's selling technology of some sort. You know? When I showed him my flip phone, he ran. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he knocked, and I hollered louder, come in! Well, it took three hours before I finally come in. He says, uh, sir, did you mean that? <laughs> I said, of course I meant it. Well, he says, where I come from, I'm not used to people just saying, come in. I said, so where do you come from? He's a neat, neat looking kid, 30 years old. He says, uh, I come from New York City. I said, oh, I suppose, okay. Uh, I said, you kind of look like you might have some Native American in you. I've got a bunch of kids here who live with me. And, and no, he says, I'm, I'm not. He said, my mother's Japanese. But, well, he looked kind of Native American. Uh, knowing he was from New York City, I thought, I better try this kid out politically. Uh, better check this kid out politically. So uh, I said, you know, I said, tell me, we're talking a lot about reparations. The idea that we need to pay the descendants of slaves for the harm we did to their grandparents 
who were slaves. We need to give these people some money. What do you think about that? I said, I kind of buy into that. I kind of think that's a good idea. Well, I said, you know, I've been thinking on that line, and it seems to me that the Japanese ought to make reparations for Pearl Harbor. Maybe that's when I showed him the flip phone. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I know he left. But I was very friendly to him. I mean, he looked at that and he said, huh? And I said, you're right. It's stupid. You don't owe anybody one dime because of what some ancestor of yours did. And neither do I. Neither do I. Well, God hates sin. But he loves a sinner. God hates sin. He loves a sinner. God loves every color, creed, and nationality that there is. But Christianity, Christianity is being nice, but it is more than being nice. Just being nice. And that's the new gospel that we're going to be reading in books. One of the authors that I have really loved has made a complete swing. Uh, wow. So the gospel is, Jesus was asked. So what's important? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, elsewhere we learn that if you really love God, you obey his commandments. So it's not just be nice. It's obey me. It's love me with everything you are. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will walk in obedience unto God's word. Right. And then he said, and the second is love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. And that means everybody you <clears throat> run into, regardless of their ethnic origin or background or preference or anything else. So we have a call to love everybody. But our doctrine is not just be nice. Our doctrine is to walk in obedience unto God's word. The gospel is still about sinners coming to repentance. It's still about sinners coming to repentance. Not one ethnic group hugging another ethnic group. That's part of being a believer. But it's not the gospel of Christ. Stand with me. We're done with critical race theory. If you missed this meeting, you can get it on tape. Because I did not consider it a topic that we ought to even spend time on. If it weren't infiltrating the church, I wouldn't go there. Heavenly Father, Lord, there have been a lot of studies, God. Lord, you know how many people have studied trying to figure out where the races began when we all started from Adam. But Lord, DNA pools collected in different areas, and before long differences began to become apparent, and groups formed. But Father, we are all brothers and sisters especially those of us who have come to know you as Lord and Savior, and we have brothers and sisters in every possible ethnic mix in the world. We are all one. We are all one. And God, you know that in reality in this country, our ethnic groups have made enormous strides forward in the last 50 or 60 years. How sad, how horrible that any political policy could attempt to drive a wedge between people to bring about a revolution. Father, I pray that all people of all ethnic backgrounds in our country could come to realize that this is nothing more than a ploy to create division. God, I pray that within the church, 
Lord, we watched the main denominations years ago attempt to preach a social gospel. And many of them have since closed their doors. Oh, Father, I pray that evangelical circles would not leap to this possible doctrine in exchange for the real doctrine of Christ, of sinners coming to salvation through your blood on the cross. So, Lord, may each of us love our brother as ourself. May we love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, meaning, therefore, Lord, that we are willing to walk in obedience unto your word. For these things, Lord, we will thank you in your name. Amen. amen. God bless you. Amen.